All righty, folks, we're straight up at six o'clock, so we're going to get started. I want to welcome you all, and thank you for joining the Arizona Historical Society tonight for Ancient Snapshots, Verde Valley Family Life from the 11th to the 14th centuries. It's being presented um, as part of our brand new um, On the Road with Arizona History series, which showcases our certified museums, some of our certified museums throughout the state of Arizona. And tonight we're absolutely thrilled to have the Verde Valley Archaeology Center here to present this evening's program. You're going to learn more about them um, in just a few min minutes, but I want to first let you know a little bit about us. My name is Shelly Correll, and I am the Membership and Outreach Coordinator here for the Arizona Historical Society. And working with me tonight um, on the back end is Robert Freck, our, one of our historians and our development associate. A couple of reminders for tonight. We've got this chat box um, available to you. Go ahead and introduce yourself and free feel to ask questions. I've asked our speaker what his preference is, and he would like to go ahead and field questions after or at the end of his presentation. Um, got a big crowd tonight, so we encourage that if you're not presenting, that you put your video off and keep yourself on mute until the end of the program when we start that Q&A. My friend Robert, he's going to go ahead and send uh, record this evening, and we'll be sending out, for everyone who's registered, you're going to get the recording within the next week or two. If you enjoyed this program, uh, we invite you to become a member. Uh, we are absolutely thrilled that for the past 18 months that we have been presenting most of these programs free of charge. And we thank our champions of history, our, our members, for helping to support this type of free programming for the public. Our mission here at the Arizona Historical Society, the thing that we wake up every day and say, we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it right, is we connect people through the power of Arizona history. And, we do that through a number of ways. We were founded way back in 1864. We're both a state agency and a nonprofit. So I like to say we've got the heart of a nonprofit. We do that important mission work, but we also have the muscle of the state. So we got mission and muscle. We operate two flagship museums. Uh, the first in Tempe, the Arizona Heritage Center. And we also have the Arizona History Museum in Tucson. We are currently operating two historic properties as museums, Pioneer Museum up in Flagstaff and the enchanting uh, Sanguinity House Museum and Gardens in Yuma. We, uh, this, over the next few months, we're gonna be introducing some refreshes at both Pioneer and Flagstaff in Yuma uh, at Sanguinetti House. And we invite you to check out some exciting things that are going on at our historic properties. So I told you our mission is to connect people through the power of history, and we do that a couple different ways. We collect, preserve, and tell the story of Arizona's past through our museum exhibits. We do it through our library and archives, through those historic sites, through educational programs, and through our award-winning journal of Arizona history. And in order to get that journal, you do need to be a member. We invite you to get connected with us. As I said, you're welcome to join. You can sign up for our non-spammy email list. We send out a couple times a month an uh, email with Arizona history news and stories. Uh, you can follow us on social media, media. You can order our license plate, which celebrates the power of the monsoons. And you can do all of that on our website, which is azhs.org. Our speaker tonight is Ken Zoll, who um, is the executive director of the Verde Valley Archaeology Center in Camp Verde. So he's a founding member and the current executive director, and he is also the regional coordinator for the State Steward Program of Arizona State Parks and Trails that trains volunteers to monitor archaeological sites in Sedona and the Verde Valley area. He has conducted extensive fieldwork in ancient astronomical practices of the Southwest and is a certified instructor in ancient astronomy fieldwork. Ken is the author of several books and articles in professional journals on local ancient rock and art astronomical practices. His current research involves several meteorite fragments from meteor crater that were found at or near ancient dwellings in the Verde Valley. He received a BS and MBA degrees from Loyola University in Chicago 
and resides in Sedona, Arizona. So folks, um, again, welcome. And it is my pleasure to turn things over yes. to Ken Zoll with the Verde Valley Archaeology Go, Kenny! <laughs> Go, Kenny! Hello, hello, hello. Yeah! So I will uh, start my presentation. And uh, so what we're gonna be talking about is uh, the findings from the Dyke Cliff Dwelling. And uh, this was, uh, the artifacts were given to the center by the Paul Dyke Foundation Research Institution for American Indian Culture. Um, and I always like to start with this land acknowledgement. Um, the Hopi tribe and the Yavapai Apache Nation are on our advisory council. Uh, and actually announced today, we're very excited, Lloyd uh, Asiamtua was just named the uh, new superintendent for Montezuma Castle and Tuzigu. And we are the official nonprofit partners of both of those national monuments. And Lloyd is from uh, Third Mesa, the village of Old Arrivi, and is of the Water uh, Coyote Clan. And we've already had several meetings and we, we really welcome him here. And in our land acknowledgement statement, is we make a formal statement that we recognize and respect the indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between the indigenous people and their traditional territories. This is an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on in a way of honoring the indigenous people who have been living and working on the land for millennia. It is important to understand the long existing history that has brought us to reside in the land and to seek to understand our place within that history. And this statement uh, is, uh, will be on our website and we always uh, be in our talks with this and uh, has been endorsed by both the Hopi tribe and the Avapai Apache Nation. So what we're talking about, as I said, is the, uh, uh, the Paul Dyke uh, cliff dwelling. Uh, this was a site that was occupied between the 11th and 14th centuries. So who was Paul Dyke? Well, Paul Dyke was born in 1917, actually in Chicago, uh, and he passed away in 2006. His parents pioneered in Calgary, Alberta, Canada at the turn of the 20th century among the Blackfoot. Over time, uh, Paul developed close relationships with Blackfoot, Crow, Cheyenne, Lakota, and other Plains Native people. But when he turned 11, because they were from a famous painting family in Europe, uh, they sent Paul back to Europe to learn painting at age 11 uh, with his uncle. And then at age 15, they enrolled him in the Munich Academy of Art, where he studied for three years. Uh, during his time in Munich, he met the chief of the uh, Rosebud Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. And uh, the chief invited him to come uh, visit the reservation when he got back to the States. So when he turned 18, he did go back to the States and he went right to the Rosebud Sioux Reservation. And shortly thereafter, um, as uh, things would happen, he married the daughter of the Sioux chief. Unfortunately, about a year and a half later, she passed away during childbirth with the baby. So he got very depressed. He went west, got on his motorcycle and traveled around, ended up settling in Arizona in 1938 in the town of Rimrock, which is just south of Camp Verde. When he bought the property, he found out that on it was a cliff dwelling. And to his amazement, when he went in, it turned out that it had never been pot hunted. It sat untouched for 700 years until he got there. But because he saw canoers going by Beaver Creek, because the creek was right at the foot of the cliff dwellings, uh, he put uh, cyclone fencing in front of it and big signs keep out. And basically never told anybody about it uh, until 1961. And as it says there, he banned painting again after World War II around 1953 and became a sensation and went around the country doing all kind of one-man shows. And those are a couple of his paintings you see there that specialize in his love of the Plains Indians. Uh, in 1961, he was doing a art exhibit at the LA County Museum. And he mentioned the cliff dwelling to the, uh, to the uh, curator who happened to be an archeologist. And he offered to come out and take a peek, which he did. And he was blown away by it. And so for the next 10 years during the summers, he brought PhD students uh, to excavate during the summers as part of their PhD uh, field training. And during that time, they extracted over 50,000 artifacts, boxed them correctly as you're supposed to, uh, did the field notes, took uh, pictures in C2, et cetera. And when Paul passed away and we became certified as a repository, uh, the family came in and gave us all 50,000 plus items. So what we're gonna go through today is uh, those, those particular, some of those items. It's obviously, we don't have the time to go through all 50,000 items, uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna arrange it in, in this kind of this order. I'll give you a really brief overview of the cultural setting of the uh, cliff dwelling, and then we'll talk about the shelter, 
Uh, and then we'll break down all the artifacts into subjects like diet and subsistence, tools, clothing and ornaments, household goods, and then leisure time. So when we talk about the cultural settings, you can see that on the left side there, uh, a yellow star over by Sanawa. That's pretty much where the cliff dwelling is. It's in the center of the uh, Sanawa culture. Uh, it turns out that the property actually abuts the property of the National Park Service, the Montezuma Well uh, segment of the Montezuma Castle National Monument. Uh, so they were neighbors, Montezuma Well and the cliff dwelling people here uh, were neighbors. And when you look at the timeline on the right, many of you are familiar with the uh, Pecos Conference uh, member, uh, method of uh, classification. And uh, the Nike family sits right in there somewhere at the end of Pueblo II to the uh, very, very beginning of Pueblo IV. And in the Verde Valley, uh, we refer to this as the uh, Camp Verde phase, Honaki phase, and then the uh, Tuzigut phase. But basically it's from roughly 1050 AD to about 1325, so when they resided here. Uh, this is the shelter. Uh, there's two parts. On the left is what we refer to as the annex. There were three rooms in there. And on the right side, the main alcove actually has uh, six rooms in there. So altogether is nine rooms. And um, the interesting part, this is a, a LIDAR map of the main uh, feature. And what you see there is the, unlike Montezuma Castle, which is very shallow, so there's only one to two room deep uh, within it, uh, this is a very deep cave. So they didn't have to put uh, a, a a wall at the front or at the face of it. Instead, they went and they built up masonry walls to separate the big cave into separate rooms. So as you can see there, room one, two, three, four, plus the lower room. And off to the left, you see what's called the kiva. Now, we don't know if it was truly a kiva in, in the true sense of a ceremonial room, uh, but Paul uh, Dyke uh, thought it had similarities to Akiva, but you'll see a little piece of it. Uh, and so he named it Akiva, and, and so the archaeologists uh, have retained that, uh, that name. And you can see scattered around there different cysts, cysts one, two, three, four, five, uh, and others uh, areas. And that's where most of the artifacts were, were stored. Here's typical of a wall that's uh, within the uh, dwelling that separated the rooms within the cave. Uh, remarkably and still excellent shape. Uh, you can still see the plaster and, and the uh, rocks that were used to uh, create the, the wall divisions. And then <clears throat> this is what's referred to as the kiva. Uh, you can basically see way in the back here, kind of a circular depressed area. You can see a lot of um, charring from fires that they had in here and what we call a bench that goes actually all the way around and it's kind of shiny from their, uh, their sitting on it for, for many, many years. So there's a wall here and then they would enter through a little very small opening and then go into what we think was the ceremonial room. And there were quite a few artifacts found within this particular room, some of which may or may not have religious connotations. So we're gonna go first into diet and subsistence. Uh, what we found was the botanical remains showed that the cliff dwellers and uh, inhabitants consumed a very device, diverse diet. You'll see some examples. Uh, in addition, the faunal assemblage uh, contained 25 identifiable species including at least 16 species of mammals, seven of birds, two of fish, and three species of reptiles, all of which could have been a part of their subsistence strategy. Everybody's familiar with the three uh, kind of three-legged stool of, of, uh, of the prehistoric cultures, corn, beans, and squash. And you look at these, remember, these are this is 700 years old, uh, and they look like you just went to the uh, native seed search to uh, buy some new seeds here. Uh, and of the corn kernels, we have over 3,500 corn kernels, three colors, yellow, red, and purple, blue. We have 176 beans of four different species. And we have 3,000 plus uh, squash seeds of three different species. Uh, some of these uh, we have sent off to uh, University of Arizona. They're doing different DNA analysis on it, trying to figure out their origin. Uh, it's highly unlikely that they are viable any longer. They tell us generally if it's older than 80 years, it's probably not viable. But if we can find out through their DNA, if there's some current strains, we do have a Native American traditional use garden uh, on our property. And uh, we do have a garden. And uh, if we can find similar uh, material or different pl similar plants, uh, we plan on uh, planting those in our garden. I mentioned corn kernels. Well, we have over 9,000 corn cobs. 
And, and unlike a lot of them that you see in ruins today, they kind of look like the small Chinese corns. Uh, a lot of these corn cobs that we have are huge. Uh, the one on the left is about eight inches long. Um, and so uh, the, the old adage that the corn was tiny just certainly does not hold true, uh, at least as far as this particular cave dwelling is concerned. Uh, we, there are Arizona uh, walnut trees along Beaver Creek. And as you would expect, uh, we have over 2,900 uh, Arizona black walnuts, both in uh, uncut and also shelled. Uh, so we know that was clearly a part of their diet. We have hard shell squashes. You got the crust on the left and you got the peduncle on the right. And we have quite a few uh, squashes to show that they were in fact uh, part of their diet. Prickly pear, again, as you might expect, uh, in the collection we have fruit and seeds and pads. Uh, the Arizona Ar uh, Archaeological and Historical Society provided us with a grant and we were able to carbon date uh, the seeds and it came back at 801210, uh, which is pretty much at the early stages of their inhab inhabitants there. So uh, they've been using and eating the prickly pears for, for quite a while. Uh, we have a number of roasted agave and roasted yucca. So we see the roasted agave on the left and some uh, roasted banana yucca on the right, including some of their seeds. So we know they were doing that. And with that, we also have the choya buds and flowers, which is fairly rare. Um, and the, on the right, you see a close-up of the uh, two of them that are over on the left. Uh, so clearly, again, they were, they were eating uh, these as well. And I mentioned the uh, roasted agave and, uh, and uh, yucca. And we also have more than 3,000 quids. If you're not familiar with quids, uh, sometimes it's referred to as prehistoric chewing gum. So when you would roast the agave or the yucca, uh, you would get the leaves and somewhat like you eat a artichoke where you, today we would just put the leaf in our, in our mouth and, and use our teeth to get off the, uh, the, the uh, pulp. Uh, they would just put the whole leaf in their mouth and chew it and uh, extract all of the, the juices from it. And then we got done, they would spit out the remaining fibers. And so we have over 3,000 quids, which clearly tells you they were chewing a lot of agave and quids. Okay. This was a very interesting um, find. Uh, if, if this is a, a red cloth that, that they wove. So number one, you've got the first show of textiles from there. It was dyed red, which must have some significance. And it was tied with yucca cordage. To our amazement, this is how it was found when we were given the collection. Uh, the people who excavated these back in the 60s uh, did not open this up. Uh, and so, of course, we couldn't wait. <laughs> and so we opened it up. And what we found in it was amaranth seeds and shafts. Um, People sometimes ask, you know, if they're coming into the center, uh, I'd like to volunteer. What kind of things can you can I do? And uh, so I sometimes mention this. I said, well, Evelyn came in one day and she said, what can I do today? And we said, well, we'd like you to count all of the amaranth seeds. So she sat there all day and counted 31,575 seeds, seeds within this uh, bundle. Uh, Dr. Karen Adams uh, is, has coordinated two professional teams to conduct specialized studies on the amaranth seeds. They've done uh, some DNA analysis on it, and they've concluded that it's the first domesticate amaranth ever found uh, in the American Southwest. So uh, it's, it's a significant find. And again, the Arizona Archaeological and History Society uh, provided us a grant for the, real, uh, for the carbon dating of the seeds, and it came back uh, with two different ranges, 1021 to 1165, and 1035 to 1186. So again, uh, fairly close to the earliest part of their uh, uh, habitation within the cliff dwelling. And uh, a lot of people do not realize that there is a prehistoric salt mine within the Verde Valley. Uh, it's referred to obviously as the Verde Salt Mine. It's one of only four prehistoric sources of salt in the American Southwest. Uh, the other is Grand Canyon, uh, Zuni Lake, and another one uh, that's currently under Lake Powell. Uh, and so they would come to the Verde Valley for their, for their uh, salt. And within the cliff dwelling, uh, we measured 11 pounds of salt from the Verde salt mine, which is about five miles away from the cliff dwelling. Uh, interestingly, you see the blue streak within the salt. Uh, the Hopi do not refer to this area as the Verde or Green Valley. They refer to it as the Blue Valley uh, because of the blue salt 
uh, the blue streaks within the salt, but also the azurite and malachite that can be mined within the Jerome area. And plus we have the Verde River and six perennially running streams. So uh, Blue Valley is, is actually a more appropriate name uh, than, than, uh, than the Verde Valley in, in a number of ways. By the, by the way, since the Hopi are on our advisory council, uh, when I go up there to, to consult um, and they know I'm coming, they often will call me and ask if I could bring some, some of the salt from the mine uh, to, uh, uh, to bring up to them. There's almost no edible salt any longer, uh, but there is uh, what was referred to as more of a chemical uh, industrial type of salt, more of a purgative type. And uh, so I do bring small bags of that. <clears throat> I have a, uh, it was mentioned earlier that we also monitor the uh, Arizona sites. I have a Hopi uh, woman who uh, monitors the salt mine for us. Uh, she comes down a couple times uh, a year. And uh, the first time she didn't know where it was, I took her there and uh, she was looking around uh, quite, uh, quite a lot. And I was asked her, what are you looking for? And she goes, well, I was told by the elders that there will be a salt woman shrine here somewhere. And I said, well, I've never, I've been around all over and I have never seen anything that even resembled a shrine. And she says, well, you can go now. Um, if I can't find it, I've got instructions as to how to make one. So I was uh, unceremoniously dismissed <laughs> for her for ceremony purposes, which was just fine. That's what we expect. And uh, I'll end the diet substance with the, uh, uh, copper light analysis. Uh, some of you may be uh, familiar with copper lights. Uh, basically, it's fossilized human feces. And uh, we have 40 from within the cave. And uh, we were giving a, 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 our doctor, uh, Todd Boswick, who uh, basically did the report on this uh, site, was giving a talk down in Tucson. And, and a professor came up and said, hey, that's my specialty. And he wanted some samples. So we uh, sent 10 uh, samples uh, to uh, Dr. Carl Reinhardt at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, and he has done some preliminary uh, analysis of the, of the diet within those uh, uh, coprolites. And you can see this long list of uh, his initial results. And some of those we, we just talked about, uh, but there are a few interesting things like some of the rice grasses and, and uh, hackberries that uh, were not prevalent within the cave. So um, this source of information was pretty interesting. Another side little story is uh, we sent that to them and he called back later and, and, and uh, uh, somewhat uh, complaining that one of the uh, coprolites we sent him was that of a dog and not human. So, um, of course, we couldn't tell the difference. But the good thing about that is we had no clue that they had dogs living with them. So now we know that within the cave dwelling, they did have a dog uh, living with them. So uh, just a happenstance discovery. So tools. Uh, basic tools of cliff dwellers were determined, obviously, by the materials that, that were of, at their disposal locally. And so we have a large number of stone tools. Uh, we have an axe head on the left. We have a number of monos in the center. Uh, interestingly, there were no matates. So whether they took them with them or, or they did their grinding somewhere else, we're not quite sure. But uh, we do have a, quite a few uh, uh, monos. Uh, we have scraping tools there on the right, top right. The bottom left is a pretty big up, uh, blow up of uh, two uh, microblades. Uh, one is obsidian and one is of chert, very sharp edges. Uh, and then in the center, we have a variety of cutting tools and then quite a large collection of, as you would expect, uh, arrowheads or projectile points. Uh, but the large collection is somewhat of a mystery that we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, we also have fire drill hearths from within it. Uh, again, these, this is a sample of some of them. Uh, Boy Scouts uh, might recognize some of these. <clears throat> and we have wooden bows. Uh, we have four large bows, two small bows, and uh, one that looked like it was in the process of being made, but not finished yet. And a lot of them are double notched. So people who are into archery would understand the, the purpose of the double notch. Uh, but the uh, in process was an interesting find because we had a student from Northern Arizona University who was doing his master thesis, um, so now a bow construction. And he came down to examine our bows and he said that when he found the one that was in process, it caused him to change the conclusion as to how they were made. So he's presented his paper and, and he, uh, it was accepted. So he, he now has his master's in experimental um, archeology. span uh, One of the more amazing items in the collection are painted reed arrow shafts. 
Uh, we have over 70 arrows. Uh, a little over 40 of them are painted, uh, as you see here, different colors, different shapes. And you can see bits of sinew, and uh, they actually were painted under where the feathers would be. And you can see in some of these, like here you can see a bit of the uh, uh, feather uh, uh, shaft. Uh, here's another piece of uh, feather. Uh, each of these had three, every arrow had three of these uh, feathers attached to it with, with sinew. But none of these, uh, as I said, here you got patterns, here you got lines, here you got squiggles, here's got a different kind of blocking and some dotted lines back here. We have no clue as to why they would have painted these. If they were so, some of them similar, you might have said, well, that's a sign of possession. Uh, who owns them? Who gets credit when there's a kill? Um, but they're all different. And so we have no clue. We did a study. Uh, we actually did a seminar here a few years ago on projectile points, and we presented this. And again, uh, the people who were there said, yeah, we've seen this before, but we don't know why they did it. And, in, and uh, we had one in particular, uh, unpainted, as you can see here, but it was attached with a great horned owl feather fletching. Uh, and you can see the broken piece down at the bottom, and there's another broken piece on the other side. And uh, what well, we gathered by examining them all, that all of the arrows had three feathers attached with, with Senu. Now, the amazing part, when I showed you earlier, all of those different projectile points, all of those stone, air, uh, stone arrowheads, obsidian and other, other materials, uh, amazingly, of the 70 plus arrows, only two used a stone tip. All the rest were wooden foreshafts, uh, obviously for hunting small animals. So you can see a couple examples here of, of how the points uh, were made. Uh, so it was interesting to see all those um, projectile points, uh, stone projectile points, but um, seldom used. And we have a lot of bone tools. Um, you can see these is used at awls and, and other purposes. Uh, and we had them all analyzed and it came back as the, the bone tools come from uh, beaver, raccoon, weasels, deer, coyote, elk, cottontails, muskrat, and rodents, as well as quail, duck, teal, and cranes. And so uh, we can easily assume as well that not only did they um, hunt these for their uh, bones and probably feathers, uh, but they were probably part of their diet as well. And rope, okay, we have a lot of rope. We have over 5,000 pieces of cordage. Uh, and this is one of the more impressive types of cordage. You can see it's a big bundle, obviously, but uh, the, the intricacy of the and the tightness of the, uh, of the cordage is, is pretty impressive uh, to see. And we have yucca cordage net. Now they were right on, uh, right above Beaver Creek, uh, and they did have fish in there uh, in the, among the bones we found, so we know they did eat fish, and they may very well have used these. Uh, uh, nets to uh, catch their, their fish. And stairs, since we're still talking about, you know, some animals, uh, we have a fair number of snares, uh, probably to catch rodents and, and birds. So uh, again, this was a fairly, fairly rare find, but uh, uh, they're pretty well preserved. And so now we're uh, going to go into clothing and ornaments. Uh, and the inventory of textiles and cordage from the cleft dwelling has provided us with data on the raw materials, tools, weaving structures, techniques, the yarn and fabric colors, clothing types, and other informative data. We have a lot of uh, pieces of fabric. Uh, we have a lot of uh, wooden spindle whorls for spinning yarn. Uh, we have quite a few of them. In fact, we also have three. We have two spindle whorls uh, of ceramic that they formed and made it out of ceramic. And we have one that's stone, uh, but they're all pretty much in the same area. Uh, they were uh, stored together for uh, their uh, purposes. We have weaving battens. We have 14 of the weaving battens, including the one on the right. Uh, for some reason, there's two of them and they're tied together with yucca cordage. Um, we have had Hopi and Zuni weavers come to the uh, collection a number of times partly to help identify some of the items, but also just to give us their impressions. And they're, they're amazed that uh, uh, the tools that were used back then are essentially the same types of tools they use today. Uh, and in fact, there's a couple types of weaving techniques that as they study them, they still are not sure exactly how they were done. 
So uh, they'll be coming back periodically to, to try to figure that out. And what did they weave? Well, they had cotton. They definitely grew cotton uh, in the area there. We have a number of unspun cotton bundles like you see here uh, with seeds. We have over a thousand cotton seeds. Uh, some of those cotton seeds have also gone out for uh, carbonating and uh, DNA analysis. Uh, we also have cotton bowls and we have a lot of cotton seeds, as I said, over a thousand cotton seeds. And this amazingly is a ball of cotton yarn. Um, it's, uh, it looks like you just went into Michael's craft store to buy it, um, but it's a nice clean white um, cotton yarn in a ball. So they weren't that much different from the weavers of, of today. And they also uh, used yucca fiber in a lot of their processes of not only uh, sandals, but uh, other types of uh, uh, clothing. And you can see here, this is processed fiber. It looks, uh, when you get up close, it looks like human hair. It's so fine so that they could take several of these, wind them up into uh, threads or into uh, cords, etc. So we have quite a bit of processed yucca fiber um, as well. And again, I, I, even today, I look at this and I say, yeah, that's 700 years old. So uh, how it lasted this long in such a great condition, we're, we're just uh, really lucky. We have a lot of agave spines that were used as needles. We have over 30. And you can see on the left, we've got the agave spines with uh, yucca uh, uh, threads attached. And on the right, we have a needle with a cotton yarn attached. So uh, we know for a fact that obviously they were doing using both materials for their clothing and uh, uh, other purposes. And this is a pretty, pretty interesting piece. You see this kind of curved uh, cactus needle. You can see they made an eye at the top and they started to thread the, uh, the cotton yarn uh, bundle within that needle. Now, whether they're gonna make a new garment or whether they're gonna repair their garments, uh, it's, it's pure speculation, but we do have a lot of, of uh, pieces of garment that, uh, pieces of cloth that were mended. So perhaps this is how they did it. And we have uh, about 12 sandals of different sizes. Uh, almost all of them are, are similar with, they have the, the toe loop and then uh, uh, straps to go around the ankle. Quite a few of them are pretty long that they go up behind the leg to pr uh, protect the Achilles heel and they had extra wrapping around, around there. So quite a few sandals as well, very representative uh, sample. And now we'll get into some of the actual cloth. Um, by the way, we, uh, we get requests periodically from fiber art clubs, weaving clubs uh, to come in and see some of the items because as it says there, we have over 14,000 fragments of textiles. And so uh, we do arrange for uh, a special event periodically for these clubs to come in. We bring out several trays. Uh, they're all still in their uh, plastic protective uh, uh, sleeves, uh, but they can look at them and uh, uh, photograph them without flash. Uh, and uh, they, they have quite a good time when they do that. So here we have at the top kind of a plain weave cotton and the bottom one that's uh, a dyed red. This one is interesting. On the left, it's a, it's a uh, cotton plain weave textile dyed red, and then they painted black lines onto it. And from the one on the left, you really can't see the, the detail of it. So we use a, a computer program with a photograph called D-Stretch, and you can see on the right how it brought out the actual design that was painted on there. So uh, it's, it's become a very, very interesting and important tool uh, as we analyze uh, some of this material. We have an open uh, cotton uh, uh, wrap open work textile. Uh, I am not a textile person. So if you're gonna have textile questions, uh, you'll have to email me and I will try to get you an answer and get back to you. Uh, but this was, we have several pieces of this that's kind of open like that. And uh, again, a Hopi weaver said, oh, that's part of a legging uh, for a specific, a specific type of dance. So, uh, and we have quite a few fragments like this. Uh, this is uh, one always amazes me. I, it looks to me like, um, well, it gauze, they call it gauze, but uh, it looks almost like Belgian lace. It's so fine. And uh, again, on the left, you can barely see a pattern in it. But when we use D-stretch on the right, the, the pattern comes out a little bit better uh, that you can see this uh, interlocking kind of pattern that's within it. We have quite a few uh, brown tie-dyed 
uh, cotton textiles uh, that what we call a dot and square design may have represented uh, corn kernels. Uh, and some of them are fairly large segments, you know, 12 by 12 uh, fragments, uh, but they all have a very distinctive uh, dot and square designs. And as I said, we probably have 20, maybe 30 that have uh, this design on it. And then you get into some of these that look like they uh, just got ripped off of somebody's couch. Uh, it's, it's so detailed here, but this is a plain weave with supplementary weft uh, with an interlocking book design. And you can see there's actually four colors. There's a gray, uh, kind of a beige and two different shades of uh, darker brown. Uh, but you know, again, you're talking about a very primitive outdoor loom uh, to be able to do something like this. This one is very uh, eye-catching. Um, again, it's the same type. It's a diamond twill tapestry uh, pattern. Uh, and again, you see three different colors here, gray, red, and, and a cream color. And this is kind of like our piece de resistance of the textiles. It's a slit tapestry belt, six different colors. And with a close-up, you can just see how tight it is uh, and, and uh, how clean it is. Uh, after sitting in the, the, the cave for 700 years. And we have turkey feather cordage. So we, we have the, uh, uh, the uh, yucca cordage and then they would insert uh, turkey feathers within it. So most likely some sort of a ceremonial piece um, or a garment for a, a, a priest of some sort. And we have the first ever rabbit skin blanket ever found on the Verde Valley. Uh, it's, a, it's a small segment of one, but uh, it is in fact uh, rabbit uh, uh, pelt woven with the, uh, with the yucca cordage. So all of these give you a pretty good uh, idea of just, you know, type of clothing they wore. Um, and then we have, this is the most intact garments that we have are breech cloths. And we have uh, a little over 12, we have 12 intact and a few fragments. Uh, what's interesting as well, as you see the one uh, to the right, uh, at the end of the cord, um, the, um, it has a pretty fancy uh, woven uh, end um, to, the, uh, to the wraparound cord. So uh, we have yet to put one of these on display. Um, I have to rotate uh, the textiles every five months. That's pretty much the standard. You don't leave textiles out on display for four, more than five months, even though we have a temperature and humidity control and the room is in the dark until somebody walks in and then the light goes on uh, and it is, is with uh, uh, UV protected lighting. But we still don't keep it out for more than five months. But every five months or so, um, a little team gets together to decide what to uh, replace the exhibits with. And uh, I always say, well, how about a breech cloth? And, uh, and the women in the group always go, ew, and we never have had one on display yet. So one of these days, we'll, we'll get it on display. And pendants, um, we have quite a bit. I'm only gonna show you two here. We have a argillite a carved, what we think is a, a beaver that was uh, used as a pendant. And also we have two turquoise uh, still in its original cordage, uh, but a lot of it broken off. So we don't know if it was a necklace or a bracelet or what, but uh, they clearly did. And we have quite a few other pieces of of beads, shells, etc., that were used for ornamentation. So household goods, we have uh, a lot of pottery paddles. The pottery that they made was the paddle and anvil method. So uh, you would expect to see those paddles. We have a lot of trade wear that covers the entire occupation period from 10, 1050 to 1325 from the Four Corners area and, and other parts of, uh, of the state. We have one, this is the only intact um, a uh, piece of pottery we have. It's a, a corrugated jar from Monkopi. And uh, we have this, what we call a ring basket. We don't know if it was really used for rings, but it's a small basket. It's reminiscent of a ring basket uh, made of yucca. And you can just see the, the fine uh, craftsmanship within this weaving. We have a large number of coiled basket fragments. Uh, a lot of the sides of the baskets have uh, uh, I guess rotted away, but we have these. Uh, we're actually working with a Hopi master weaver and uh, we're asking her if we give her one of these pieces, could she think what could this have really been when it was whole? And she would uh, create one for us. And we put on display the fragment next to what she believes the item might have really been. And, and we'll do that in the new museum. 
uh, gourd scoops. You know, every kitchen needs some scoops. So they had gourd scoops. And then we're gonna go into leisure time because my time is running it down here. And uh, leisure time, you, you can define it however you like for ceremonial purposes, entertainment, uh, what have you. But uh, we're gonna show you just a few items that we would put in that category. And this is an interesting prayer stick. It's got the, uh, the cords as well as a, a reed that's holding it together. We also have a number of smaller prayer sticks. Uh, and again, these were identified by our, our Hopi and Zuni uh, advisors. And we have a flute, a broken flute, unfortunately. Uh, we think it had four finger holes and it was obviously used a lot because the end has been repaired with leather. And so they did, uh, they did have a flute in there. And this is a very interesting piece. It's a uh, river reed um, and you can see it's decorated. Uh, it has, uh, the black is actually um, uh, wood burning uh, and the red is painted. But if you look closely on the left, you can see that it's pretty much stopped up. But the close up below, you see they made it into a little scoop with a piece of cotton shoved in there. And when you open it up, it's full of, in this case, black pigment. So if they were gonna do some sort of painting on either pottery or most likely on rock art, uh, this is how they would transport their paint. Uh, and then they would uh, tap a little bit of it out, whatever they needed, uh, onto a palette of some sort, uh, mix it with the binding agent, which could have been uh, yucca, uh, yucca juice, animal fat, um, egg, egg yolk, egg whites, uh, urine, whatever, something to make it pliable. Um, and they would uh, just make their, make their paint liquid and, uh, and do their rock art or whatever they were doing. So this is a pretty important find. Uh, we have a wooden wand. We call it a wand for, for lack of a better term, but the end uh, appears to have been a carved animal head. Uh, you can see the black part pretty much looks like an ear. You can see an eye and pretty much a, a mouth. And we have a rattle. Um, that might have been used in dancing ceremonies. Uh, it's a single stick wrapped in cotton and the rattles are gourds and they still work. So they still deal, uh, we do still, we are still able to, to uh, hear it. Uh, another example of their uh, uh, weaving skills, you can see this woven basket, it's a very fine piece of, of uh, woven basket. But interestingly, when you look on the inside, there are five corn cobs. And you can see at least two of them, perhaps three, have holes in the end of the corn cob. So uh, we also have within the collection, set 67 corn cobs with sticks, pointed sticks inserted at the uh, fatter end of the corn cob. Uh, in this case, a Zuni uh, visitor said, oh, that was the corn cob game. Uh, and they would create hoops out of uh, corn husks. And we have some hoops made out of corn husks. And we were wondering what this is all about. And so he said, nope, that was a game. They would put feathers at one end and, and points at the other end. And basically it was the ancient version of lawn darts. Um, and so like I said, we have 67 of these. Uh, at the top piece here, uh, another interesting piece, these are all cactus needles and they're carefully wrapped with leather. Uh, and it's been suggested that this may have been a tattooing kit. Uh, they would use uh, cactus needles for tattooing. And we know they did in fact tattoo. And so uh, the only explanation of similar bundles that have been found in the Southwest are similar to this uh, have been identified as tattooing needle bundles. Uh, and in the bottom, here's a, a ball. Uh, it's basically filled with uh, uh, cotton. And then they took a cotton cloth, wrapped it around it. And then you can see the string uh, woven around it to uh, keep it together. And when you look at the pattern, it, it, yeah, on a quick look, it, it actually looks like the patterns you see on a soccer ball. Um, and so uh, there is a game that Hopi play uh, where they, uh, so the first person kicks the ball and then everybody runs to it and somebody else kicks it and they keep running and kicking, running and kicking. So uh, was that this ball? Um, we don't know for sure, but uh, clearly it was uh, something probably more for leisure entertainment. And we have 75 reed cigarettes. These are all river reeds. Uh, they all had bits of burnt edges and uh, uh, plant uh, fragments within it. So um, we're pretty sure that they were in fact 
uh, smoking. We have 75 of these. Uh, some of them are uh, intact, like they hadn't been smoked yet, but they're all pretty much bundled up in, the, in a similar uh, cyst. And here's some more uh, reads. Uh, this is again, these are uh, wood burning uh, designs put on the, uh, on the reeds. Uh, one or two, you can see a little bit of burning at the end. Uh, others have not have no evidence of burning. So maybe they were future cigarette sticks. We, we just don't know. And we have clay figurines. Um, we think the top one is perhaps a fox. We have the human head and a dog. Uh, we think these were made by the Prescott culture, so they would have been a trade item uh, that came into the area. Uh, we actually in the museum have other uh, uh, clay figurines similar to these, uh, and they are all have been identified as coming from the Prescott culture uh, nearby. So um, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, part of the reason that uh, we, uh, the Paul Dyke, uh, Paul Dyke was able to keep the collection intact after LA Museum did the report was that uh, they were supposed to write a report after which he would give them some of the items, but they never wrote the report. And so one of the first things the Dyke family asked when they gave us the item is to do the report. So Dr. Todd Boswick, who recently retired from us, he had been the archeologist for the city of Phoenix for 23 years. Uh, he took it upon himself to write the report and it took him four years. And the report you see on the left is a little over 700 pages in two volumes. Uh, and actually we're, we're almost sold out. We're down to just two copies, two sets. Uh, but we have the uh, report also on a CD. Uh, we have quite a few of those. But in the process right now, uh, general public is not interested in a 700 page book with a lot of charts and graphs and tables in it. Um, and so we're, uh, Dr. Bostwick and I are putting it down to a uh, more of a uh, uh, public friendly version of about 175 pages uh, and we're calling it the Ancient Verde Family Family Life. So a lot of these pictures that you've seen today and a lot of others will be uh, included in this book and we uh, anticipate it'll be uh, published in November. And uh, these are our, this is our website. Uh, you can go to the website and uh, you can send an email if you wanna ask me a question direct. Um, our address there uh, in Camp Verde. However, we are closing it um, after Labor Day. Uh, we, are, we are in a 3,300 square foot lease to building. Uh, and we are moving uh, over the next few months to a brand new 11,000 square foot building that we are purchasing uh, that is about four, three or four blocks down the road. Uh, Main Street turns into, changes its name at the post office and becomes Finney Flat Road. So it's basically just three blocks down, but going from 3,000 square feet to 11,000 square feet, uh, you can imagine the rest of my summer and early fall is going to be rather hectic. And we hope right now to be able to reopen uh, on Thanksgiving week. Okay. So with that, that is my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. All right, Ken, thank you for literally opening up the family album there and, and sharing with us everything from the textiles to those household items. We're going to open up the um, presentation now for questions. Um, already in the chat box, uh, Mary Jane says, wow, amazing collection. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Selena uh, chiming in also. You folks are welcome to ask the question, uh, turn on your mics, or you can post the question in the chat box. Uh, the one question there I saw was, uh, why do we think they left so, much, so many items there? Um, it, it's a big mystery. Uh, there are several theories as to why they left. Um, uh, one might have been extremely practical. Um, it is a limestone cave and uh, rocks fall from the ceiling. And uh, when they did the excavations, they did find artifacts under fallen rock. And so uh, did they say, gee whiz, the, the sky is falling, it's time for us to move away. Uh, and they left. Um, there is also uh, a theory tied to Montezuma Castle. Uh, the question is, uh, at Montezuma, if you've been to Montezuma Castle, you have Montezuma Castle way up high and then off to the... Uh, West, you have what's called Castle A, which is a five-story Pueblo built up against the cliff, and it burnt down uh, somewhere around 1325, 1350. And the big mystery was why. So the archaeologists there not only did carbon dating of the, of the uh, burnt timbers in Castle A, but there was also burning in the uh, roof beams of Montezuma Castle, and the dates came back identical. And so when they talked to the Hopi and they uh, talked to the Yavapai and the Apache, the, the stories melded that uh, the Apache and the Yavapai wanted 
uh, the Montezuma uh, Castle little plateau there that's surrounded by Beaver Creek, that's great for farming, etc. and that they attacked the castle with flaming arrows. And uh, in the process, they burned down Castle A and, uh, and uh, the people in, in the castle up above apparently surrendered and came down. Uh, but they probably, again, this is the theory from that, they would then run down or up Beaver Creek, which was right there, uh, to get away. And the very next thing they came across was Montezuma Well, and they abandoned that. And then right next to that is the Dyke family uh, uh, dwelling. And so it, they may have just started a stampede of people away from, uh, from the Apache uh, attacking. So um, we don't know for sure, but if you were living in a panic, you're not gonna grab every little corn kernel you know, that's sitting in your, in your room. So. So we've also got Christina asking, were the sandals made from different fibers or mostly the same one and which one? Uh, they're pretty much all yucca. Yeah, I don't, I, in fact, I can't think of another one that was not made of yucca. Jim asked, any analysis of what was in the cigarettes and what they smoked? Uh, you know, that's what we have. Uh, there's so much, as you can tell in the collection. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to develop uh, a curation fund that will allow us to do things like that. Uh, so we were able to get the grant from uh, Arizona Archaeological and, and Historical Society for some carbon dating. Uh, and so we've been looking for other grants. So, uh, you know, that's that's one of those things. And like I said, uh, Dr. Uh, Adams has taken the uh, amaranth and cotton and corn seeds and she's doing analysis. And Dr. Reinhardt took the copper light. So uh, we're looking for other researchers who want to do that kind of work. So um, any, any hungry uh, uh, master student out there wants to do a master thesis on some of this, uh, we can work with you. All right, as far as those sandals, did you guys find any pairs? Sienna wants to know. Any paired? Any pairs, or were they all single? You know, that's funny. Uh, they were all singles, and um, then you got to realize they had a dog. Well, what does dog do? In, your, in my house, my dog always eats, chews up one <laughs> shoe from each pair, so <laughs> who knows if they, he did the same thing. Alrighty, Mark wants to know, will the caves ever be open to the public? No, um, they, they were, uh, it was owned by the Dyke family uh, uh, from 1938 until uh, just two years ago, and they sold it. Uh, and so it's, it's still in private hands, but everything in the cave has been removed. There's really nothing left to see other than the cave itself. Uh, and we have yet to make any contact with the new owners. It's one of those that bought it and, uh, and we've never seen them, so we don't know what they're going to do with it. All righty. Any other questions for Ken, folks? Almost exactly at the one hour mark. Pretty yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, oh, interesting question on the, did the Apache actually, uh, did they attack them? Um, the the uh, bodies from Castle A, the bodies that were found were charred. Um, and so they, they obviously burned the castle down and uh, uh, some people didn't get out and they, and they got burned. Um, I have not heard from the, the reports, any of that. Um, it, the, the Apache as the Yavapai, uh, when their members pass away, they do cremate their bodies and all of their possessions. And so the, for example, the baskets that we have of the Yavapai and the Apache, they themselves refer to those as reservation baskets. So if they were made when they were forced to go to San Carlos Reservation, they would make extra baskets for sale in the traditional way, traditional patterns, but for sale. And so to distinguish those for sale as opposed to those for personal use that would get uh, cremated with the body, they refer to those as reservation baskets. So when you see Yavapai or Apache baskets on display, uh, they themselves refer to those as reservation baskets. All righty, last call for questions. Um, Ken, I wanna thank you for taking the time tonight to visit with us. It's, there's a son's basketball go game going on. So um, appreciate you being here. Well, my, my pleasure. You're, and you're lucky because we just had a huge monsoon come through the area that sometimes knocks out my internet. So uh, it, it, it cleared up just in time. All right, perfect. All right, folks, uh, thank you so much for coming. We're gonna go ahead and, and call this one done. Uh, you guys have a, a safe evening, and if you get a chance, head on over to the Verde Valley Archaeology Center. Thank you. Sure, sure thing. Thank you.